Blossom by Consult Webs. Breakthrough insights to build a thriving law firm with your host, Tanner Jones. Hello, Lawson listeners. Today on our show, we're talking with Rich Lee, CEO and co-founder of New Era ADR. This company helps businesses and individuals achieve a resolution to their litigation challenges through its digital platform. Prior to starting at New Era, Rich was the general counsel at Civis Analytics, a fast-growing venture-backed data science technology company born out of the President Barack Obama's 2012 re-election campaign. He also serves as an advisor, board member, and investor in technology startups and venture funds. Passionate about solving the access to justice gap in the United States, Rich serves on the National Leaders Council of the Legal Services Corporation, a U.S. Senate-funded 501c3 that's the largest funder of civil legal aid in the country. Today's topic is on the adoption of new technology by risk-averse attorneys. It's a very important topic, and Rich, very glad to have you today. Thanks for having me, Tanner. So it's no secret that the legal field, let's say, can be resistant to change. Why do you think attorneys tend to be more risk averse compared to maybe other technologies or rather other industries when it comes to adopting new technology in particular? I think there are a lot of reasons. Um, I'll start with the, the fundamental one, right? I think a, a root cause of it is, you know, as attorneys, and, and I am one, um, you know, we're, we're trained to, to issue spot, right? And to identify all the things that are wrong or that could go wrong in any situation. Um, and so I think naturally when you know, you've been trained to think that way, um, which by the way, I, I think is also a, a trait that leads to, you know, what I tell a lot of attorneys, which is that I think attorneys um, often will make the best business people, uh, but we can, we can get into that separately. But I think because we are so trained, you know, on finding the faults, you know, naturally it's going to be hard, right. For someone so tuned into the downsides to, to get over the risk aversion without, you know, actually kind of, kind of being conscious of it. Um, you know, on top of that, there's just, it's, you know, oftentimes a large time commitment, um, depending on, you know, the organization, if it's a law firm or if it's a company, you know, in a company, um, a lot of times the spend, you know, you may not have budget for, for certain new technologies. Um, in a law firm, a lot of times, you know, while, you know, some firms, you know, do really, really well financially, a lot of times I think the, the, the firm itself isn't structured for, you know, long-term commitment. Um, and so a myriad of factors, but I think that root cause goes back to, and I think the thing that drives it is the fact that, hey, you know, we've been trained to, to find everything wrong with the situation. It makes sense. I, I've, I've not honestly heard that angle before, um, but I have, you know, I've, I've worked with law firms for well over a decade and, and most certainly risk aversion is a, is a key trait uh, that, that many, many utilize. And in, in many instances, it can be a hugely advantageous trait to the business, but it can also um, really pin down a business and, and, and hinder their ability to grow, especially as technology evolves pretty dramatically. And I think that's the angle I'd like to take this discussion. I mean, undoubtedly, there's tons of benefits to adopting new technologies, especially those that really focus on improving efficiencies or productivity within a law firm. But one key challenge with that is getting everyone within the firm on the same page, working toward essentially the same goal for maximum effectiveness. So based on your experience here, how can law firm owners successfully train and really foster the adoption of new technologies, not only among their staff, but especially with their attorneys? I think, you know, for, well, to, to get the owners, uh, I'll speak more around the perspective of getting the owners and, you know, the decision makers on board mm -hmm. first. Um, and I, I think that translates down, though, to, to the rest of the, the firm. And it's the fact that, you know, at the end of the day, the firm is, it's still a business. Um, and so, you know, the things that the firm cares about, time, profits, right, top line growth as well, um, training for its associates, you know, and of course, client experience, I think tying that technology to, you know, to, um, to, to, to those benefits is incredibly valuable, right? And I think one of the biggest things is, and I see this in um, a lot of marketing and promotional materials uh, or conversations that I've had live, right? Which is, I think a lot of folks, especially the technology, you know, providers, um, 
one obvious thing that I think they often overlook is, you know, explaining everything from the perspective of what's in it for the firm, right? And what's in it for the attorney, mm -hmm. right? And I, I think it's easy to get lost, especially as, as a technology provider, right? In all the cool things that your tech can do, um, all the different features, the traits, the functions. Um, but if you don't directly translate that sometimes to how it's going to save people time, how it's going to, you know, grow your revenues, how it's going to put more money in your, in your pocket, you know, by way of profits, um, or how it's going to, you know, make all your attorneys better. I think, you know, that gets lost. And so that's, that's from that, that leadership perspective. And then as leaders, then, you know, in a law firm, translating that message and, and just, you know, basically furthering it on, you know, to the rest of the team. Um, and explaining why ultimately this is going to make, make everybody's lives better, um, I think is, is really critical, right? Um, you know, but again, it's, you know, at that level, then it's, you know, the firm leader explaining things, not necessarily at the benefit for, for the firm, right? But explaining why it's better for each individual attorney, each individual staff member, you know, why it's going to make their lives better. Um, so at the end of the day, there's always like, you know, that little bit of selfishness, right, in, in everybody and decision making. No doubt. I mean, that that's key for buy in. And, and I see just from my experience in um, observing law firms uh, implement new technologies, let's say specifically like a lead management software. Um, th there is there's resistance, most certainly, but there's also challenge in implementation because they've missed the point that you've just hit on. And I, I want to stress that to our listeners, it, it really starts fundamentally with that understanding connecting the dots on what is this technology solving? Um, what is it making better within our lives, within our business, and just helping to connect those dots because the buy-in is what's going to help ultimately force or, or at least um, uh, you know, support the implementation and the success of that technology. So we've, we've hit on that point, but any other specific strategies or approaches you've found help to overcome maybe the average attorney's resistance to change when it comes to technology? I think... You know, and, and this also sounds kind of obvious too, but another point that, uh, you know, I see often overlooked is, you know, just anticipating the questions and objections, right? Um, you know, so I'm a technologist, but, you know, I, I was an attorney, I still am an attorney, so I understand, you know, how how we think, right? But um, it's the same, it's the same principle, whether it's, you know, a salesperson selling to a law firm, a law firm, you know, leader selling to to their internal staff. Um, understanding, like, you know, is, is this lead management system going to, you know, affect my business development capabilities? Or, you know, is it going to affect the, the way I do things? Or, you know, is this automation tool going to, you know, kind of mess up my workflow or potentially even reduce, you know, or affect the number of hours that, that I can bill, right? And, and thinking ahead, you know, on those fronts, right? So, for instance, using myself as an example, Right in New Era, you know, our, our biggest thing is that we've reinvented litigation, right? And, you know, we're saving organizations and people up to 90%, right? And the amount of time and money they spend um, litigating a case. And so this is a pretty radically simplified approach to, to litigation uh, because at the end of the day, you still get that legally enforceable decision. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we anticipate the questions of, you know, what, who, who, are the, who are the people who are going to be hearing my cases? Right. And how are you actually going to do this? Um, you know, uh, security, um, confidentiality. Right. How is my data, anything I upload in your system going to be protected? And so we we've thought through all of these as well as, you know, sometimes the objections that people won't won't voice, which I think is is really, really important. Right. Um, you may have, you know, for, using our example again. Right. Um, there may be some attorneys who might think, well, if it's faster litigation, does that mean I have reduced hours? But then helping explain that, hey, you know, this is actually going to pave the way to way more litigation being filed. Because when you change the mindset of lawsuit, meaning a two plus year slog and millions of dollars to mm -hmm. something that can be done in 60 to 100 days, so many of the disputes that aren't filed nowadays will get filed, right? And so it's explaining things like that. And internally, it's the same thing. Right. Um, you know, what's IT going to care about, you know, if I try and roll out this new tool um, to my firm, um, you know, and think through all the, the security, privacy implementation questions ahead of time and, and be able to talk through those. Um, I think that's important, you know, rather than, 
you know these questions are coming, but rather than waiting for them to come and then thinking through those, kind of being prepared ahead of time. Yeah, that, that makes makes a lot of sense. And I, I do want to dive in a little further into New Era ADR in particular in a moment. Mm -hmm. um, before we do that, I want to step back just a moment because you know, we've hit kind of very high level uh, around this concept of uh, being risk averse, especially when it comes to, to adapting technology within my law firm. And I'd be curious to hear from your experience, where, what are you seeing as some of this broad technology or broad offerings that attorneys are in, in particular are hesitant to adopt? I know you, you, you did note uh, certain aspects like security concerns or any technology that would include confidential information. Anything else just to help maybe add some perspective to our listeners on what we could be referring to? Technologies that are giving attorneys pause today what they're hesitant to adopt you know more broadly speaking first right one, one of the the most common ones right now is you know any technology that's going to touch on confidential you know or private information mm -hmm. right um especially for law firms right and i think rightfully so because you know client data protection is so critical um i mean the trust is everything right and so I think that in itself is is a driver for a lot of things. You know, the most obvious technology right now that everybody's talking about is generative AI. And with generative AI, I think, you know, it's it's both a fear of the unknown, but also it's still a little bit of the unknown in the sense that people know that data is involved, right? And that, you know, they may be sharing data into a system, so to speak. But then I think sometimes the lack of understanding of like what actually happens to that data, what is the data governance, you know, behind something that that I might share into a system. I think, you know, that that even though it's uh, that additional unknown, I think, um, affects folks a lot. So I think a lot of the, the things that are that are big right now, um, I mean, you know, any sort of like law firm operations management platforms, um, you know, certainly anything that right now involves AI, like while it may seem really exciting, I think at the same time, that may be why I think a lot of these AI tools are also running into some adoption problems. And I really wanted to draw that out, uh, you know, in preparation of talking a little bit about your group, because I know you, those are clearly things that your group has considered, you've thought through, um, and it's critically important uh, for a law firm to know that, you know, who, know who's behind the technology or the software that you're utilizing and know that, you know, they share similar values and commitments when it comes to protecting that type of, of data. So let's move into New Era ADR. Now, first of all, ADR stands for Advanced Dispute Resolution. Is that correct? We call it Advanced Dispute Resolution. The more commonly known use of ADR is Alternative Dispute Resolution. Yeah, it, it's used to describe, you know, alternatives to using the court system. Uh, to, to, you know, resolve a dispute, right? Because we all know, I mean, our, our court system is just overburdened right now. Lots and lots of cases, everything's behind. Um, but the cases themselves, each individual one, whether big or small, can take a really, really long time and cost a lot of money. Um, and so ADR came about, you know, a long time ago, actually, um, you know, where private organizations and nonprofits created essentially arbitration forums and mediation forums, you know, where people can come and get, you know, a legally enforceable decision, you know, in arbitration, um, or, you know, have a mediator, like a third party, um, you know, try and help two sides get to some sort of resolution on their dispute. Um, so almost like, you know, talking them through it, almost like a settlement conference. Um, so that's generally what ADR refers to is, you know, generally arbitration and mediation. So speak to how this has, you know, impacted either businesses, attorneys, w w what's really the experience that um, individuals are, are encountering when they're using this type of technology? I think on the one hand, you know, and, and kind of before we came along, right, and, and thinking about ADR more broadly, you know, it arbitration and mediation are meant to try and get parties to a, you know, a resolution faster. Um, you know, and I think it's done that in some instances, right? Uh, and in terms of a practice, you know, certainly law firms have had to adapt, uh, firms on both sides, right? Plaintiff side and defense side have had to adapt. Um, you know, over the years, there have been some complaints, right, about especially arbitration, right? Some elements of arbitration, um, the confidentiality, uh, the confidential nature of it really is one of the, uh, the big things that people constantly bring up. Um, as well as, you know, I think a lot of folks have realized that 
a lot of times arbitration is just as expensive, right? And, and just as time consuming um, as a lot of these other forums. And I mean, and that's something that, you know, my co-founders and I realize, and that's, that was one of the frustrations we shared. And that's why we, you know, created a new era was, you know, to create that like almost like third path, um, you know, to the, the kind of legacy uh, platforms. Very intriguing. Um, what about any personal experiences you've seen that demonstrate a positive impact? That emerging technology, whether it be New Era ADR or any other technology, how it's had a positive impact on some of these risk averse attorneys. Any stories you, you'd like to share? Well, we've already gotten a few, you know, at, at New Era for sure, um, in the sense that, you know, here's a way that's, you know, I just described, you know, some of the problems. And here's a way where it's, you know, much faster, much more efficient, much cheaper to resolve your legal disputes, you know, and, you know, get it from the same quality arbitrators and mediators that are out there, you know, and so naturally, you know, there's a little bit of a, you know, how, how, how do you make that work, right? How do you make it so much cheaper, so much faster, um, and just as high quality, all fully virtual? Um, but we've had some, you know, good success stories that, you know, will, I think there will just be more and more of these where, you know, we are seeing parties get to a resolution really fast, um, you know, and within our time frames. But then more importantly, I think one really interesting dynamic, and it's now happened twice, um, actually potentially a third time. We're, we're trying to get to the bottom of like, of why another case resolved, you know, much sooner than, than, uh, than even we promised. Um, but we've had at least two cases where, you know, both sides came um, and, you know, I, we promised 60 to 100 day arbitrations and decisions. And, you know, we're seeing that I think when parties, when both sides realize that that there's no gamesmanship to be had, right? Which is a lot of times why litigation takes so long and why it's so expensive is because, hey, both sides play games. Um, right. You know, when you take that away and you kind of accelerate the pragmatism and you just tell the parties, like, you're taking away your ability to play games. We're forcing you to get to the point. And I think when they see that just on the horizon, much less having to even engage in it, they're like, you know what? There's no games to be had. Let's just get this thing knocked out. Right. And I think that's good for everybody. It's good for, you know, certainly businesses. They can get back to business, focus on what they need to build. But it's also really, really good, right, for the consumers and the employees. Because um, instead of, you know, waiting two years to have your case heard because you thought some company or somebody wronged you, you're getting that resolution in 60 days, right? And you can move on with your lives. If you're owed anything, you're going to get paid out in 60. And it's better for the plaintiff's attorneys, too. Right. And that they're going to collect, you know, a lot of times they work on contingency um, and they'll collect their portions much sooner. Right. than than in the traditional system. Um, and so it's been really interesting seeing that dynamic of, you know, our thesis was getting people. Our thesis kind of ended right at getting people to a, a faster resolution. But then now seeing this additional dynamic of, hey, the fact that there will be a faster resolution just gets the two sides to just be more reasonable sooner. Um, which frankly, you know, we could just use all across society anyways, and, you know, hopefully take the temperature down. Thanks for taking time to explain that. I'd like to end with, um, a question where we step back a little bit more, because really the topic is, is around those risk averse attorneys, especially when it comes to, to implementing new technologies. And, and this is, this is only going to become more and more common, you know, as, as technology evolves and there seems to be a, a an app or a solution, a tech solution for virtually everything within a business. So the idea here is that, you know, innovation, that's just naturally um, inevitable. It's going to happen. It's going to continue to evolve. What emerging technologies do you foresee or anticipate having the biggest potential to transform, maybe even disrupt the legal industry specifically? Well, the one obvious one is generative AI, right? Um, and this is a foundational technology, right? It's going to come in the form of many different applications and, and ways of deploying this. But fundamentally, the ability for a computer system to generate something that might a lot of times take an attorney hours. Um, you know, this is, it's game changing, right? And the other one is blockchain technology. Um, from a generative AI standpoint, I think for attorneys, you know, you've got to embrace this, right? You've got to learn how to work with it, learn how you can use it to set yourself apart, right? We're still in the early days of AI um, and the early days of generative AI. And I think, you know, 
the media makes it seem like, you know, we're already, you know, decades in. I mean, it's not, right? And so I think any attorney who embraces this and learns it, um, and the user interfaces on these tools are incredibly intuitive. Uh, and so you don't need to be tech savvy. You don't need to know, you know, code um, to know how to use this, uh, this tool. So I think the attorneys who embrace it now and use it to set themselves apart, they're going to you know, be way more efficient, deliver way better products, you know, and frankly, ultimately um, deliver way better client experiences. Right. Um, so, you know, it's just it's just a matter of getting used to it. Right. And from a blockchain standpoint, you know, blockchain generative AI is this year's version of like what blockchain was, I think, the last two years. Um, and blockchain is not going away. Right. I think there's just been so much more you know, time and attention now suddenly um, focused on AI. Um, but blockchain technology, I think, is really important. Right. And it, it can change a lot of things, especially smart contracts, um, you know, changing how transactions are recorded, settlements are recorded. I mean, you think about like property titles and property recordation or title recording, um, you know, that, that's something that doesn't need to be such a, a like paper intensive long process, right? And then even just property transfer and title transfer, um, IP management, data governance, we talked a little bit about data, right? But for organizations to be able to secure it and use blockchain technology to maintain, you know, a very kind of transparent, but, you know, immutable kind of record of how data is used across their systems, you know, it's incredibly valuable. Um, you know, and so I think on both sides, right, for attorneys, you know, whether you're law firm side or you're, uh, your tech side or not tech side, company side. Um, I think it's important to at least at the very least understand how all this stuff works, because at some point it's going to come up. Um, and of course, even better, go experiment with it. That's sound, sound advice. I mean, that's honestly one of the best ways to do it is just get your feet wet. You have to, you have to start somewhere. And a lot of these, uh, many of these technologies have demos available. They have the ability to do trial, uh, trial periods. Um, so you have ways to absolutely test and, and get an experience with it. In fact, we have we have a great resource we'll drop into the show notes uh, here for our listeners, but it's, it's the top GPT AI powered tools for law firms today. And that's a good resource just to get started in terms of fundamentally what's available to me. And then that'll give you avenues to explore further. Uh, but Rich, I appreciate that advice and, and truly appreciate all the time and the value that you've shared with our listeners today. Uh, any final words or, or final final pieces you'd want to touch on before we wrap up? Uh, no, other than that last piece, uh, you know, technology is exciting, right? And and I think the fear comes from going back to what we said at the top of the show, you know, the unknown, right? And and there's a solution for that unknown, which is you know getting in there, experimenting with it, um, understanding how it works, right? And just getting familiar. Um, and a lot of times most technologies will end up feeling pretty intuitive. Uh, so, you know, I would just encourage everybody to, to get out there and, you know, experiment with this stuff. Rich, what's the best way for our listeners to contact you? Uh, you can email me, um, you know, at rich.lee at neweraadr.com. Thanks again, Rich. Really enjoyed it. Thank you. Blossom by Consult Webs with Tanner Jones. For show notes, links, and info, go to consultwebs.com slash podcast. Be sure to subscribe and leave us a review. Watch for the next Lawsome episode to discover more breakthrough insights to build a thriving law firm.